In my last video, I went over some terms and definitions to help us understand the very foundations of counterpoint. So now that we understand the very basic nature of counterpoint, this video is going to get into the rules of counterpoint and will also develop into some more definitions about counterpoint. After this, I will have a video about one-to-one -one counterpoint and I will also go over certain definitions and things that are in these videos in the moment, but it is really good just to hear these things a first time now, get it fresh in our mind of things that we might be seeing or hearing later, and things that you can think about before you actually dive into the one-to-one -one counterpoint video. Okay, so the very first rule of one-to-one -one counterpoint is that it favors stepwise motion. So as you can see on the left, it's going stepwise motion up that D, E, and that F, and that is known as stepwise motion. So the note is just traveling up to the next possible note. Stepwise motion can be up or down, but it doesn't skip any notes. It's just the next possible note next to it. So leaps on the other hand, as you can see, this is showing an E to a C, are anything larger. So a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and an octave. While on the other hand, you can think about the stepwise motion as just the interval of a second, since it's just going to the next possible note, it's creating a second. Rule number two, scale degrees seven and four, or four and seven, or in other words, T and Fa, or Fa and T in Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, create a tritone, which is not allowed. So if we're in the key of C, and we go up to that seventh degree or the seventh note in the scale, which is B. And we connect it to the fourth note in the scale, which again from this C is F. Okay, the fourth note in the scale is F. See, we have that tritone. So that's a seven to four or a T to Fa. But the thing is, like I taught in my tritone video, a tritone can be inverted and it is still a tritone. So if we're going from now four to seven, we still have a tritone. In other words, fa and t, or in this case, simply f and b. So in the case of C major, you cannot combine the notes f and b or b and f. It doesn't matter if one comes before the other one, you can't use that combination of notes. It is a tritone. Those are the only two pair of notes that create a tritone in the major scale which is actually a very important topic. It ties into why all of the other skills were actually created. David Bennett has a really good video on that. It's called, Why Is There No Note Here? Something like that. And it shows a piano and it shows the B sharp and the E sharp. And it says, why is there no note here? And he talks about basically the history of the scales being made. It's a really well-made video. It's phenomenal. Rule number three, favor smaller melodic leaps, use large leaps fairly rarely. These are going to have a tendency to stick out a lot more to the listener and create a sort of bump in the melody, which can be a good thing, but you can always have too much of a good thing. Rule number four, usually leaps are recovered in the opposite direction by a step. So if it leaps up, normally you're going to have one step down, or if it leaps down, you're going to have one step going up. This is especially true if the leap is larger than a third. And even more so if it is a leap that is ascending. So if you have a note that leaps up, it is a lot more important to recover it in that one note going down. Not doing this can leave a displeasing melody to the listener as melodies seem to carry a gravity to them. If you throw the melody up without having a downward step, it can sound like it is just abruptly leaping up and down instead of leaping up and then gently falling back down, which is a very nice thing for the listener. Rule number five, gap and fill. When there's a large leap, this creates a gap between the two notes. The fill technique takes advantage of this and fills in the notes one would expect to be played in the gap. For example, let's say we have a high A and it leaps down to a low A. So the notes that you would expect to fill in that gap are G, F, E, D, C, and B leading you back to that A again from that original A. Rule number six, a line that is considered melodically fluent should have a clear beginning, middle, and an end. We will always end on scale degree one. This is very important because scale degree one is the strongest signal that we can give the listener to let them know that the melody has ended. Another thing to look for is that the melody has an interesting high point or a low point to it. 
This high point or low point must be a consonant interval away from the tonic. The high point or low point are often not found directly in the center of the melody. Rule number seven, triadic content. A stable melody creates a musically coherent experience for the listener. The melody defines the key or the mode that you are in. The triadic notes are spread out horizontally and heard throughout time, versus being stacked in harmony and heard at once. A tonic triad is comprised of the notes from the scale degrees 1, 3, and 5, or in C major, C, E, and G. A good cantus is oftentimes built mainly from these tonic chord tones. Furthermore, the other notes in the cantus can be considered its relationship to those tonic chord tones. Melodies that highlight this create a potential for a more clear melodic fluency for the listener. Rule 8. Well-written melodies have a sense of goal-directed motion. This can be described as a thought-out plot for the directions and movements of the song. Rule number nine, avoid repeated tones. Also avoid repeated patterns. The cantus firmus should be the smallest form of a complete melody that cannot be broken down or subdivided further. This means you have no motivity. This video will go over what motivity means if you are unsure, so stick around if you wanna know. But something really good to keep in mind is that typically the finish exercise is cantable, meaning that it is composed to imitate the range of the human voice. This also means that it is easily translatable to singing or humming for the average person. Cantable is an Italian word which means singable or song-like. Cantable instrumental music can be thought of instruments being composed to imitate the natural range of the human voice. Motives in music are different than the usual idea of motives in verbal speech. Motives in verbal speech can be derived from the concept of motivation. These types of motives can usually be thought of as things to help, such as wants and needs that provokes an action in order to obtain them. On the other hand, motives can also be something different, which can also be called a motif or a leitmotif in certain different scenarios. These are like subsections of the motive. Motives and motifs can be found in art, literature, as well as music. This is the type of motive we will be talking about, but in terms of music. Of course, music is also an art form. In music, motives can be described simply as a familiar pattern of melody, rhythm, or both that repeat throughout a song. This can act like a or the character of the song. Usually, it is the part that you will remember as the musical theme of the song or section, something that you will be humming in your head or whistling after the song is over. For example, the Jaws motive. We just have that semitone that just... Which is one of the most simple motives ever written because it literally is a semitone motive. And it is very suspenseful, but I know that the first time I heard it, it was something that caught my ear and was catchy and I was humming it. And this has a lot to do with the rhythm of it too, which is something good to keep in mind that a motive is not just about the harmonic effect of what's going on, it's also the rhythmic effect. A good thing to comprehend is that a lot of motives are more rememberable in their rhythmic part than they are in their harmonic part. So maybe this will be for another video or something, but it's the idea that in the theme melody of the song, the motive, that you could play the actual exact notes in random order and someone might not be able to tell what the heck that is, but you might be able to play one single note over and over, but the rhythm of it, and someone might be able to tell exactly what you mean by that. Okay, so motive and leitmotif are the same things. And the only thing that differs them from one another is how they are used in context. Motives can be used anywhere in a musical context, while a leitmotif is usually used in the context of a dramatic work. This can be thought of as a distinguishable and a clear musical phrase that has the purpose of symbolizing or representing something dramatic. Such as a location, a theme, an object, a character, or a state of being. Because of this, you will find motives anywhere in music, but leitmotifs would be used in things like plays, operas, film scores, or well-composed songs, even things like characters in a movie. A certain song that will represent a certain character would be a leitmotif of that character. An example of leitmotifs would be John Williams' works such as the Star Wars, Harry Potter, 
Jurassic Park, and Superman theme songs. In a show or movie, oftentimes each individual character will have their own theme song that is unique to them. That is an example of a leitmotif. Okay, so now we went over the basics that are going to help us when I talk about certain things in the first one-to-one -one counterpoint video. Now when I say certain words and describe certain things, it's not going to be confusing and I'm not going to have to explain as much. So I'm very excited to see you over at the one-to-one -one counterpoint video. If you found this video helpful at all, please give it a thumbs up so other people have a better potential of seeing it. If you want to see more videos like this, I'm going to have videos coming out at least once a week, and my main videos are all going to be leading up to composing. I'm going to have videos going over the violin soon, and then also scoring a solo violin piece. I also have chapter one of my audiobook coming out on this channel very soon. So stick around, exciting things are happening, and a lot of things are still unannounced. Thank you for watching and have a good one.